Okay, um, we, have, we have so much to do, all right? I do not have your mini exams graded. I started them, I didn't finish them. Um, I don't have a new one for you. So let's just get down to business. This means you need to be doing your homework, getting caught up on homework right now. Um, we are gonna finish up 12-2, hopefully. Where's my whipping stick? Where's my little, my, there it is. Did I, what did I say, 12-2? I meant, I meant 13 too. So we're going to finish up 13 too. And to try and help expedite this process, I've done a couple of problems on my own by hand, and I have them here so we can just look through them. So take a copy. Then here's another problem I did by hand. So take some of these, pass them around. Those, and then take some of these, pass them around. And then. Let's see here. Let me keep one for me. There's two, there's two sheets here, okay? So take one of each. And I was able to get that, um, and I, well, let me let it get around first. Everyone have one yet? No? Okay, so for this problem, we're doing a line integral and this is where we finished last time. I don't think I did this problem. So we're trying to do the line integral over the curve C of x squared dx plus y squared dy plus z squared dz, where C consists of the line segments from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 2, negative 1, and then another segment from 1, 2, negative 1 to 3, 2, 0. And we're trying to evaluate this line integral. All right. So go ahead and, and look at the sheet that I have here and we'll just talk through this. So the first thing is you have to, you split up the, everyone have one? Yes? Okay, first you split up the integral into three separate integrals, and that was just notation. Notice there's one integral symbol, and then three terms, so it splits into three separate integrals. They're all over the curve C, so now what I do is I go about trying to figure out a way I can find pr uh, parametric equations for the uh, curve C. So I look at C as being the union of two different curves, two different line segments, and I create vector, um, a vector function using the r, r equals um, u times tv, which is the vector equation for a line segment. I use my initial point, 0, 0, and then this is the direction vector. So that's the vector created by going from one point to the other. And then I go ahead and just clean it up. I make sure I put that t is between 0 and 1. And then I, I grab the components of the uh, vector function, and those are my parametric equations. Now I labeled them x1, y1, z1, so that it corresponds with r1, which corresponds with curve 1, right? So I do that for the first line segment. Then for the second line segment, I do the same thing, starting out at the point 1, 2, negative 1. Then I generate the vector that goes from that point to that other point, which was, what was it, uh, 3, 2, what was it? What was the second point here? Uh, 3, 2, 0, right? So the vector that goes from here to here, you subtract, right? And that's how I, that's how I came up with that, uh, that's how I came up with this direction vector right here for C2. Are you all following this? Okay, and then I came up with the parametric equations. Here they are. All right, now, taking the integral, go back to the integral. We had three separate integrals. The first one's with respect to x, second one's with respect to y, third one's with respect to z. But they're, all three of these are over the curve c. So I need to take this integral and split it up into c1, c2, and then the second integral, c1, c2, and then third integral, c1, c2. So I'm going to have a total of six integrals here. Here they are. So here's splitting up the first one, C1, C2, second one, third one. Now, one by one, I go in and I replace things. So what is X, if I'm on C1, what's the X, uh, the, the, what is the X going to be replaced with? Yeah, so you go back up here. On C1, X is the T, right? So I replace, I replace the um, X squared with T squared. And then what is DX? It's the derivative of 
the x on C1. So I go back up to C1, I take the derivative of x with respect to t, which is 1. And that goes here. And then dt. Understand? And I have to do that for each one of these. So the next one, I go x squared again. This time, what do I replace x with? 1 plus 2t, because I'm on C2 now. I'm on the second curve. So I replace it with 1 plus 2t squared. And then dx is the derivative of that, which is just going to be 2 and then dt. Is this clear? Do I need to actually go through and explain all the rest of these? I got one question. Yes. Where did you get 2, 0, 1? Where did I get 2, 0, 1? It's the vector connecting the two points on the line segment. Remember, to create a vector between two points, you take one point, subtract the coordinates. Yeah. That's, what I, that's why I got it. Okay. okay, and then I went ahead and I have the antiderivatives of each of these here. Um, I didn't show the work for this one, but you could like expand this out and then collect like terms and then take the antiderivative. So there are your antiderivatives. And then you evaluate each one of those at 1 and each one of those at 0, do your subtraction. At the end of the day, you get 35 thirds. OK? All right, let's move on. All right, what we've done up to this point is we've done line integrals. And every time we've done a line integral, the function we're integrating over has been a scalar function, meaning that you plug numbers into this function and it spits out a number, right? That's what a scalar function is. Numbers go in, number comes out. So everything in 3.2 has been uh, line integrals over scalar functions. Now when we said line intervals in, sp line integrals in space, it meant we were in three-dimensional space. But prior to that, when we were doing line integrals, everything we did, we were assuming that f was a, was a uh, scalar function, all right? Now we move on and we transition into another topic, which is very different than what we were doing before, and it's line integrals over vector fields. So this time, the thing inside, the function inside, is not going to be a scalar function. It's actually going to be a vector field, which is a function that spits out vectors. So to kind of motivate the idea, we go back to 10.3 and we remember what it meant to define work. And this is from physics. Work is always going to be your force, your force dotted with, that's dot product, not multiplication, dotted with your displacement vector. So your force vector dotted with your displacement vector gives you your work. And it's a number. So this is back from 10.3. Uh, if I have a force vector and I dot it with a displacement vector like this, then the dot product gives you the work done. All right? And that's, scalar, you said, right? that's a scalar. This is a number, yes. Now, do you remember what happens if the angle between these two is um, less than 90? Should get a positive, right? And what if the um, angle between them is 90? Should get zero. Some, something is wrong with this. Hold on. I need to step back. I can't see. It. I should not be getting negative right now. I shouldn't be getting negative till over here. Something's wrong with my code. OK, let's not trust that number. Let's not trust that number, OK? I don't know why it's not doing I'm not going to go into my code right now and try and find the problem. But remember with dot products that the dot, if the dot product between them is 0, then what? They're Nine, they're, yes. Then they're perpendicular, right? If the angle between the two vectors is less than um, pi over 2, then uh, we should have a positive dot product. And then greater, it should be negative. So it looks kind of right. Up, well, I don't know. Something's off. All right, now. Imagine a point or a particle moving along a curve within a vector field. So we started this chapter off by talking about vector fields. And that just meant, hey, you've got this flat sheet of paper. Everywhere in that, on that flat sheet of paper, there's a vector, right? Yes, yes. That was last class. We drew them, and, and then Saba gave us one that was kind of cool. It had these weird little 
twist points in it and stuff. So the, imagine you've got this vector field. It could be gravitational force, it could be electromagnetic force. And then what you do is you take this particle and you try and move it through this vector field th on a curve, all right? To move that through the, let's go with gravitational fields because I think that makes most sense to a lot of us, right? Um, to move that particle through that gravitational field requires that work be done. You have to apply a force over distance, right? So we, we need to find a way of computing the total work done to move that particle through that field. And to do that, we can visualize this happening by taking, let me bring this down here, oh, a little too far. Let me turn off, let me turn off the vector field, okay? The computer seems to behave a little better when the vector field's not there. Okay, so this is a curve C, got it? This is our curve C. We do have a vector field around us right now. Okay, there it is. There's vectors at every point. Imagine that it is being like a gravitational force pulling us, right, in certain directions. Now I'm going to take it out of here. But if we're moving this particle along this curve, and, and in this um, case we're going to be going from left to right, okay? So if we're moving along this curve in this direction, then I have two vectors that I want to show you that, that you need to pay attention to. First of all, this green vector with the little purple tip on it, that's our, our unit tangent vector. And I have it labeled right here, but I will label it a little better. This is our capital T from when we were doing uh, space curves, vector curves. Capital T, does anyone remember what you do to, to, to calculate capital T? R prime T, you take the derivative of the uh, curve function and then you divide it by its own length. That is the definition of capital T. I should say capital T of T, but that is the, the definition. So what this does is it spits out, if you compute this, it'll spit out a vector that is tangent to your curve and has a length of one, right? Okay, that curve's important because that gives us kind of a direction of mo motion, right? This, that vector tells us which way we're moving, right? Then we have the capital F vector. That's the vector field. So if I were to go and pick this point, plug that point into the vector field function, whatever it is, I'm not telling you what it is, I will get this vector out. And if, if I show you the vector field, you can see kind of a little bit that these are the vectors right here. So as I move this point back this way, that red curve should start to turn this way, shouldn't it? Because it's, it should follow that field. And that's what happens if I move it over, right? It starts to follow that, the field. So if we're trying to figure out the total work done to move this particle through along this curve, we already know that the force, the force vector dotted with the displacement vector gives us the work done, right? So what I'm going to do is I can't use the tangent vector because the tangent vector is too long. If I, move, if I move this point a little bit, right, just a little bit, the displacement is not the length of the tangent vector, right? Because that's unit length. That's always one. So what I need to do is scale it back. I need to somehow scale that tangent vector and make it kind of like infinitesimally small. So what we could use to scale it back, and this is what I've got here, watch the purple vector. I need to somehow pull that tangent vector back and make that just a little infinitesimal displacement vector. And what we can use for that displacement, what we can use is we can take the tangent vector and we can scale it by something. Something really small and infinitesimal. So why don't we scale it by ds. Now do you remember what ds was? That's your arc length. That's the arc length. That's before we, were, we could find arc length of a curve. And so if we, if we scale this by the little tiny infinitesimal arc length of that blue curve, then what we'll have is a vector that points in the direction that we're going, right, the tangent vector, but we've pulled it back, scaled it by the arc length at that little infinitesimal point. 
That make kind of sense? Yeah? Okay. So if I'm trying to figure out the work done moving along this entire curve, I just look at this point, I look at a little tiny infinitesimal, and I calculate the work on that little infinitesimal. To do that, I'm going to have to take the force vector and dot it with what? This, right? That right there. So that'll be dotted with ds times the tangent vector. Now remember, this is just a number, right? That's just a number? Okay. Then, if I want to figure out the total work over the whole curve, I need to add all those up, don't I? And we do that with an integral, don't we? Okay, so I'm trying to get you to see where this formula is going to come from. Do you have a question? No? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Okay, so that's just basically everything I just said. Um, we see that we dot f with ds dt, then we add these up. We have, this, is, this would be the formula for work. Right? That would be it. Don't write this down necessarily yet, okay? But let's just make sure we understand what this formula is saying. It's saying that if we go along the curve C and we add up all these little pieces, right, then we should get the total work done. Now, R of T is the vector function which draws C. So this C right here, we would have to find a vector function that actually draws that curve. And Capital T is the unit tangent vector, which I've already uh, discussed. And that's about it. Just that T is restricted between A and B. So to draw the curve, you have to have a starting point. That's what happens when you plug in A for T. An ending point, that's what happens when you plug in B for T. Now that formula, fine, we could use that. But something really nice happens to that formula if we just do a little algebra. So remember. Since capital T is R prime T over the magnitude of R prime T, and since DS is this. Now, I'm going to remind you of what DS is. DS was the square root of DX DT squared plus DY DT squared. Uh, oops, like that, OK? That's, that's what. Um, ds was, well, dt on the end here. So this is the magnitude of the derivative of our vector curve. Why? What, if, if we have a vector function, r of t, it has, in this case, I'm doing a two-dimensional example here. Um, it has some function of t here, right, f of t and some function of t here, g of t, right? There's two functions, I don't know what they are. It could be cosine t, sine t, could be t squared and, and 5t, it doesn't matter. But if I ask you for the derivative of this, right, then you're going to take the derivative of this with respect to t, right? So I can go f prime and then g prime, right? Understand? And then what's the magnitude of that? square root of f prime squared plus g prime squared. And so this right here, ds, is the magnitude of the derivative because look what it is. It is the derivative of x, right? This is the x component, or x, uh, component of the uh, vector function with respect to t squared. So it's the derivative squared plus the derivative of the y component squared. Now what's nice about this if you follow that, is that if we rewrite this, look what happens. If I take f, I dot it with and I rewrite capital T this way, and I rewrite ds as this, these cancel, don't they? This cancels with this. And all you're left with is f dotted, I'm going to write it here, f dotted with <coughs> r prime of t dt. That's what you'd be left with if you cancel these, right? And so on the next line, we replace c and we go from a to b with respect to t because our function depends on t. And then this piece right here is a little confusing. This is replacing this. Because what does it mean to say your vector field? Just the vector field by itself like this. What does that actually mean? This notation means that you have to evaluate your vector field along the curve, right? Our vector field is a vector field. You plug any point you want into it. 
but we only want the points along our curve C. So we would like to plug our curve, R of T, into that function. And I notate here what that means. You take your um, curve, your space curve, evaluate your vector field at it means you plug in uh, for X, Y, and Z, you plug in the um, component functions into your vector field. So you'll see, we have to work through an example. I'm just trying to get the motivation for the formula here. Are you all ready to do one? Yes, the vector field in this formula needs to be evaluated at the components of the curve that draws the, the C, right? The, the R of T that draws, not the prime, but the R of T that draws the curve. Okay, all right, let's try and do an example. This, uh, yeah, I have a summary here. Here it is. If F is a continuous vector field defined on a smooth curve C, where C is parameterized by some R of T, some space curve, where T is between A and B, then the line integral of the vector field along the, serve, uh, the curve C is, now this is the notation we use for it. This is the notation we use for work, okay? But what does that mean? It means this, and that's the formula from the previous page. That's what it means. This formula came from this. So I'm just putting all the equivalent forms of it. So if you see, if you ever see in your homework or something, calculate this. This is what they mean. They mean go find the work, all right? So do you remember when we've been doing integrals, I mean our whole lives, when we first started doing integrals, we integrated with respect to x, didn't we? That was the first integrals we ever did. Um, and then, um, Earlier this semester, we were doing like dA, and I told you that that meant we were integrating with respect to area, and that was for double integrals, right? And then we were integrating with respect to V, which was with respect to volume, and those were triple integrals, right? And I said, keep an eye on that D thing, because it, it, it matters. It, it, it's going to start to really indicate what we're working with. Here, this is just a, a scalar function. This is linear. This is an area, right? Double integral. Volume, it's a triple integral. And then we moved on and we did ds last time. And that was a line integral. And that was with respect to arc length. And this is the first time ever that the notation we have has d and then a vector, right? dr, but that's a vector. This is, this right here, this, this uh, differential is what we call this, really kind of helps you remember what you're dealing with. This tells me I'm dealing with vector fields because I'm integrating over a curve, over a um, space curve, a vector function, right? I'm integrating over a vector function here, integrating with respect to arc length, volume, area, and then just a line. Make sense? Kind of? Eh? All right. Uh, please uh, note that if you, with, uh, with work, if you change the direction you, you move along the curve, it changes the sign of the answer. So if you reverse direction, you get the opposite answer. That's good and bad. I mean, it's good because if you get an answer and you go the wrong direction, you know that you have the answer. You're just off by a number, like a sign. OK. Now, I, I, I gave you this one worked out. But I think we can go through it fast enough that I can write some stuff on the board. Um, I also highlighted quarter on the, uh, on the notes up here because if, you, if you're following along with the notes that I have online, I put top half of the circle. And I wanted to do top quarter, and then I worked it out, and I realized that the answer was zero at the end, and I thought that was boring. So I'm going to change it again. And for what I'm going to do up here, I just want to do, um, let's just do, instead of the top quarter, I'll just draw what I want. Our curve is going to be going from the point 1, 0 along the unit circle right here to this point, which is pi over 4 there. That's where I want to go. I just want to move a point, OK? I want to move a point from here to here along this curve, right? And I want to know the work done 
by the gradient vector field of this function. Okay? So if I want to know the work done, automatically I should be thinking work is the integral over C of the force or of the field dotted dr, right? That's that's what I'm thinking work. But this really just means the integral over the curve C of F evaluated along the curve dotted with the derivative of the curve, right, dt. Yes? Okay. I need a couple of things. I need the curve and I need the field, right? Capital F. I wasn't given capital F, was I? But what am I told to do? Find the work done by the what? Gradient vector field of this scalar function. What is the gradient vector field of a scalar function? It's the deriv partial derivative vector thing that we create. So let me get that first. I know that my field should be equal to the gradient of the scalar function f. That's what I'm told. I need to get the field created by the gradient of that scalar function. So when I take the gradient, in this case it's two-dimensional, I take the partial of this with respect to x, and then the partial with respect to y, and I pop them in right here. And I did that on the page I handed you, right? Everyone follow that that's just, I'm going to write a little different, 2x plus 2y, 2x plus 2y. Do you all agree with that? Okay, that is the derivative, the, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, partial derivative of little f with respect to y. So there's my gradient vector field. Now, I also need r of t. So what is r of t here? It's the curve that draws that little, um, little circle piece, right? So cosine t, sine t would work. And what are my restrictions on t? 0 to pi over 4, right? Because I only want to draw this piece right here. Okay. That's pretty much, uh, oh no, I need the derivative of that, don't I, in the formula? I need the derivative of r. So we may as well get the derivative. So r prime of t will be equal to the vector, what do we got? Negative sine t, uh, cosine t. Okay. We should be ready to do this now. We have all the pieces we need, I think. What is the integral going to go from? 0 to pi over 4, right? And now this very important part. f of the vector function r of t means you take this field right here and you replace x with what? With this thing, right? You replace every x you see with cosine t because this is the x component, right? This is the y component. I replace every x in here with cosine t and every y in here with sine t. Make sense? But that's inside my vector field. So that's a vector. So I, when I write this, I have a vector. It is 2x plus 2y. So 2 cosine t plus 2 sine t. That's just this right here. Then comma, now this, which is the same thing, isn't it? Okay, so 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, and then dotted, dotted with, so I'm going to dot this with the derivative over there, right? Uh, it is plus, yes, it is plus. I'm slightly distracted right now. You got to wake up, man. Wake up or go outside, do something, okay? All right, so what goes in here? What goes next? Negative sine t, cosine t? Negative sine t, cosine t, dt. And now we dot. So dot product's the easy one, right? Cross product's the harder one. So dot product, you just do 
this component times this component plus this component times this component. And I worked that out on the page already for you. All right, I think at this point I won't work out much more. We'll go to the end. So when I dotted those, do you see, oh, I handed all of them out. Are there any extras? There's some extras here. So when I dotted those, I think something canceled, didn't it? Oh no. There we go. Who needs one? Anyone need one? We're good? Okay, so when I dotted those together, had to be careful with the signs, and you see that negative two sine, uh, sine t, cosine t, and the two sine t, cosine t at the end, they cancel, right? And then I have negative two sine squared t plus two uh, cosine squared t. And on the next line, I factored out the two. You all see that? And then how did cosine squared t minus sine squared t change into cosine two t? That's an identity. That's a precal identity. So that's how that became cosine 2t. And then at that point I integrated. So the antiderivative of cosine 2t is 1 half sine 2t. But I already had a 2 on the outside, so it just becomes sine 2t. And then, so the only difference here is that our, we're going to go sine of 2t. We're going to go from 0 to pi over 4 instead. And so we get, uh, when you plug pi over 4 in here, you actually get pi over 2. So you're going to get sine of pi over 2 minus, plug in 0, you get sine of 0. So sine of pi over 2 is going to be 1 minus 0. You get the answer is 1. So the total work done moving from here to here is 1. And now those units would depend on, on how things are being defined here, but that would be the work. Okay? What if we had gone a quarter circle to the, straight to the top here? Then it would have been 0 to pi over 2, right, which is the work I did here, and our work would have been 0, which is weird. How could your work be 0? Well, here's, here's the picture. How can you have negative work? I mean, 0 work. You have, that means you have to have negative work, right? Yes? Okay. So let's, let's take a look at this. Here's our vector field. Okay, so that's what our vector field is doing. All right? And as we move through here, notice the angle between the tangent vector and the force vector. It is less than 90, right? So we should have positive work here. But then once we get to a certain point, which is about right there, it looks like they're going to be at 90, right? So our work, our work there would be zero. But then as we move across here, now the angle opens up, and now we have negative work because it's a dot product, right? So if you get all the way to the top of this circle, then the work done on the first half is going to cancel out the work done on the second half, and you get zero total, total work, OK? I just thought zero total work was boring. That's why I wanted to come back and only go to here. So what would the work be, what would the work be from pi over 4 to pi? It would have to be negative 1, wouldn't it? Because it has to offset 1. So it would have to be negative 1. All right. All right, this one. This, this time, I don't try and hide the question in the wording. It's straight up, right there. Find f dot dr over c, where I give you the vector field. Here it is. Nothing's hiding from you. c is the parabola from uh, parabola y equals 1 plus x squared from negative 1, 2 to 1, 2. All right. Let's see here. Let me draw the curve first. That's a, parab that's a problem we're working with, right? And we're going from negative 1 to two, 1, 2. 
So I want to move this way, don't I? Like that? That's my curve C. My curve C only goes from here to here. C. Yeah? All right, you need to now come up with a vector function, R of T, which draws that. So what are you going to use? So this is the one that we talked about last class. That if you ever have like a traditional function where it's all for y, then you can just use, leave your x as t, and then leave your, use your y, um, replace your y with 1 plus, in this case, t squared. You all follow that from last class? Okay, now what are our restrictions on t, though, if we're going to do this? It's the same restrictions we would have on x, so from negative 1 to 1, right? Because t is x, basically. So we want to go from negative 1 to 1. So let's just double check that this works. If we start at t is negative 1, we're going to have negative 1, 2, right? If t is 0, we're going to have 0, 1, which would put us here. And then if t is 1, we should be at 1, 2. So it looks like it does draw it in, in the direction of these arrows. Right? Any questions there? We're going to need r prime, aren't we? Let's may as well get r prime now. So I need r prime of t. That's going to be 1 and then 2t. Oof. I have to take f. And what do I need to do with f? What's the only thing that I have to do in this problem with f? Substitute, right? Just substitute, not r prime, but r into, the, into this. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to replace it with t. And everywhere I see a y, I'm going to replace it with 1 plus t squared. And I'm supposed to take that and dot it with this. And then integrate that with respect to t from negative 1 to 1. OK. So integral, negative 1 to 1. OK, let's get this vector. It's going to be, I think it's going to be ugly. Let's see. I replace all my x's with t's. So I've got t over square root of, OK, this is going to become t squared plus y squared. Now, y squared is this squared, isn't it? Which is t squared plus 2, I'm sorry, not t squared. It's I'm squaring that, right? So it's going to be t to the fourth plus 2t squared plus 1. That's, that's what's going to go in there next to that? So can I go ahead and put it together with this now? OK. So that'll be t to the fourth plus 3t squared plus 1, comma. Now I move to the second piece. And the second piece is going to give me 1 plus t squared on top, because that's y, over the square root of the same thing, right? t to the fourth plus t, 3t squared plus 1. That's the, that is the vector field evaluated along the curve c. I'm going to dot that with the derivative, which is 1, 2t. And all that's going to be integrated with respect to t. And let's dot it. Life's about to look like it sucks pretty bad here in a second. Let's see. Integral negative 1 to 1. And then when I do this times 1, it's just itself, right? And then when I do this times 2t, I'm going to just distribute a 2t up top. They'll both have the same denominator, won't they? So I'll be able to put them together. So if I don't move too fast here for you, I believe, well, I'll, I'll do it, OK. t over uh, square root of t to the fourth plus 3t squared plus 1 plus 2t times that is 2t plus t squared over square root of t to the fourth plus 3t squared plus 1 dt, all of that, right? And now put them together into one. What did I do? Oh, I left the 2t squared. OK. I think I'm just getting old. 
Yeah, it's, I'm just getting old. That's what it is. 2t cubed. It's embarrassing how my math, you know, is starting to fall apart a little bit. Uh, one of these days I'll just be in here like, oh. well, not there yet. I have a ways to go, hopefully. All right, so equals, let's see, integral, negative 1 to 1. All right, combined, we've got 2t cubed, right? Plus 3t over t to the fourth plus 3t squared plus 1dt. Hmm. The u sub might work here. A u sub because the derivative, if we take this whole thing under here, not the root, but if we take that fourth degree polynomial and take its derivative, we're going to get uh, a third degree polynomial, right? So we might be able to actually work that. It what? It might. It might. However, there's something even more elegant that can get us the answer. Oh, like is that a perfect square? Um, yeah, I know what you're saying. Like create a perfect square down here. You might be able to do that, but even if you did that, then how do you handle the stuff up here? Because normally when we do the completing of the square, um, we're able to rewrite it in a form that we could do like trig sub on, but we don't have all this crap sitting up here. So that wouldn't necessarily work. So let me, let me remind you of something real quick. What is an odd function? Odd functions. Odd functions are functions that when you plug in x, it's the, what? It's not the same as plugging in negative x. That's an even, like this is an even function, right? Plugging in x is the same as plugging in negative x. Odd functions, plugging in a negative is the same as just plugging in positive but changing it to negative. Examples of, of um, odd functions. Uh, sine is odd. Uh, sine x is odd. Um, how about x cubed? x cubed is odd, right? Now, odd functions have a very important property. Yeah, they're, they're reflections over the origin. So if I do an integral and I ask you for the area from here to, let's say, stop somewhere, like to stay, say stop at A, and then also go backwards to negative a, what's the area? The area is always zero, right? So for an odd function, if you integrate between negative a and a, you get zero, if it's an odd function. Oh wait, so same here. If I go from here, stop somewhere at a, and I go backwards negative a, that area is going to offset and you get an area under there of zero, right? So the question is here, are we going from like negative a to a? So maybe if I can just show it's even or odd, then I'm done. Is this an odd function? So what happens if you plug in a negative number, a negative number in here, into this? Well, this doesn't change, right, at all? Because everything is to the fourth power or squared. So if I plug in a negative here, it's going to be the same as plugging in a positive. Agreed? But if I plug in a negative here and I cube it, what happens? It becomes negative. If I plug in a negative here, it's going to become negative. And then I could factor the negative out, and it would, it would look exactly like the positive one did. So college algebra is where we learn about even and odd functions. And there's, you could go through and check it and test it. I'm just here to tell you this is an odd function. And it goes from negative a to a. And therefore, the answer is 0. And I don't have to do anything. But it relies on that being an odd function. That's not something obvious that you would have necessarily seen right off the bat. But now that you've seen it, you kind of, you know. Is that something that's acceptable? Oh, yeah. Well, you have to state this now. You have to state because this is odd and it goes from negative A to A, it's 0. And we would have to prove it. 
What's that? So would, we, would we have to prove it just by plugging in? Uh, uh, how do you prove something's odd? I mean, you have to basically say, ask yourself this question, is f of, is f of negative t equal to negative f of t? That's what you would have to do. So you plug in negative t here, you plug in t, or, and then make everything negative and see if they're the same. If they are, check, it's odd. Now, I don't mind if you would just look at that and tell me it's odd. I can tell it's odd because the denominator doesn't matter. And guess what? That's a polynomial. And look at all the powers. What are the powers? They're all odd. That's why it's an odd function. Let's see here. Anybody remember the power series expansion for sine? Yeah, <laughs> that's good, that's good. Anyone remember the power series expansion for sine? No? Can anybody, okay, so the power series expansion means that it's a bunch of powers of x, right? What are all those powers? They're all odd, why? Because sine's an odd function. It's x um, minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five, uh, five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial. This is your power series expansion for sine. And the reason, does it look familiar or no? If, if you didn't do series in Cal 2, then you don't know what the hell I'm doing up here. Okay, so the power series expansion for sine is this. This is the uh, Maclaurin series, not the Taylor series, the Maclaurin. So if you look at this, all the powers are odd, which is why, that's really why sine is called an odd function, because if you look at its power series, it's all odd. In cosine, the expansion is x squared, actually 1 minus x squared plus x to the fourth, and they're all even powers, and that's why cosine is even. So I can just look at that and be like, oh yeah, that's odd. It's all odd powers of, of t. All right, that's beyond, we're, we're kind of getting off topic here. All right, um, let's move on. There's plenty of material. Keep going. That was kind of fun. All right, now, some new notation, all right? Some new notation. If we see this again, work, right? Work. Or really, it's the line integral of f along c. Doesn't have to be work, all right? It's not always giving you work. For work to, to take place, we have to be looking at that vector f as a, as a force, and then the curve is, is displacement. But you don't have to be looking at it as a force. All right, if our vector field can be rewritten in its component form, P, Q, R. So like in the previous example, we had a two-dimensional vector field, right? This would be P, this would be Q, all right? P, Q. Then this line integral can be rewritten as, look at this. These are scalar line integrals, right? P is a scalar function now because it's just that piece that's sitting in there. The scalar function P with respect to X, scalar function Q with respect to Y, scalar function R with respect to Z. This is equivalent to the work integral. All right, now some word problems. A 180-pound man is carrying a 20-pound tool bag, right? He walks up a, hel a helical staircase wrapped around a 20-foot radius cylindrical silo. If it takes three complete revolutions to reach the top of this silo, 90-foot 90, 90 silo, then how much work is done against gravity? Note, work is measured in foot-pounds. Also, weight is a force. Yes? Yeah, I was about to say that if you've taken physics, you know that all that really matters here is the vertical displacement, right? But that's because we're working against gravity. And that field, that force field, is very simple, straight down. But if you're in a more complicated field, you can't do it that way. So this problem is we are going to get the same answer that you would get very quickly in physics, but I'm going to show you how it's set up so that if you replace that gravitational field with something more complicated, we would get, we'd be able to get the answer. Because really, you have gravitational force, but isn't there also like 
the force of the sun on us too? I mean, like if you want to, you can throw some more complicated field in there, right? And then your little quick shortcut in physics won't work. Understand? All right, so um, let's do this. We have a man that is moving up a silo. There he goes. Yay, and he gets to the top. It takes three complete revolutions. All right, so if we start at the bottom, he's right there at the bottom. And he starts walking up this 90 foot silo. He goes around one time, two times, three complete revolutions, and he is at the top. Okay? How much work is done by this guy against gravity getting up there? Okay. Got to get up. Come on. I know y'all are tired. We haven't even had Thanksgiving yet. Okay? We haven't had turkey. So if you're, if you're real tired, just go walk around or something. I think there's, there's probably, well, I'm just going to shut up. Okay, let's work through the problem. We need a couple of things here. What's our field and what's our curve? That's what we need, right? Because ultimately, we want to know the work. And the work is going to be the integral along C, the integral of F along C, which is this, F dr. Okay, so which one do you want to go after first? I don't care. You, you tell me. You want to go after the field? Okay, so the field is the, the force, right? So what can you tell me about the forces in play here? It's, it's just gravity, right? It's, it's the weight of the man and his 20-foot pail, right? Or 20-pound pail. 20-pound pail? Yeah, it's 200 pounds, right? That's it. That's the only force that's in play here one force and we can look at that force as being down if you're thinking about the force the gravitational force or you could look at the force as being up if you're talking about his force that he's having to exert to overcome gravity one or the other and it doesn't matter if you do one and I do the other we're gonna get the same answer we're gonna just be different signs so how do you want to look at the force vector as being down like a negative like down in the Z or do you want to look at it as being up in the Z I don't care. You, up, down. Let's take a vote, okay? Up, down. Okay, it's down. All right, so our vector field, what is the force in the x direction? Nothing. Y direction? Nothing. Z direction? Negative 200. Very simple field. Very simple field. What's that? Weight is force. Remember, force is mass times acceleration. And the acceleration of gravity is whatever. And then his mass is fixed. And when you multiply the two, you get weight. So weight relies on, weight depends on where you are, right? Your weight on the moon is different than your weight on Earth. But your mass on the Earth and then your mass on the moon is the same. So mass is independent of where you are. Weight is dependent on where you are. So this weight that we're given is the force. Is that good? Or you, you don't look like you want to buy that, no? Uh, You're okay with that? Yeah. Weight is a force. Okay, now, we got that, it's done. That's a, that's, a very nice, that's a very nice vector field to play with, isn't it? That's gonna be easy to dot. It's gonna be real easy to dot. Now, can you come up with a curve that draws that <clears throat> That thing, that man moving around the silo. Yeah, because if we look at it from if we look at it from the top, right? All we're doing is drawing circles, right? Just over and over. The only difference is that our z component needs to grow, doesn't it? Isn't it? It goes. It needs to go to 90 feet. So let's let's start this. How? What was the radius of the silo? What was the radius? 20 feet, so I could do 20 cosine t, 20 sine t, and that would start drawing me circles. But now I need to go up to 90, don't I? The z component's the hardest part. 
of the whole problem. This is the hardest part. Because you have to do this. Think about it this way. If you were to take that person's path around the silo and unwind it and stretch it out and look at it, you would have this. Wouldn't you have this? It would look like a, a curve, like a straight line. Like if I just unwound it, straighten it out. His path along this thing, right? That right there. If I unwind that thing, it's going to look like this curve. Yes? OK, so how, how uh, high does he go? 90 feet. How long is this distance? 6 pi. Huh? Is it? Mm. We sure? The distance? Are you talking about the distance around? If did you say six pi? Yeah. Where's the twenty in there? Doesn't the radius matter? Yeah, yeah. so it should, it should be 20. Right. I agree. 6 pi is, is, the to, is the total angle that it turns through, right? But this right here, right, if I take this and I open this up, right, one, one time around would be what? The circumference, right? Yeah, so so if I open this up, right, like this. So would the distance be 60? It, what's the circumference of this silo? 2 pi r. 2 pi r, which is? 40 pi, right? So when he goes around one time, it's 40 pi. So when he goes around three times, it's 120 pi. So are, what's not connecting here? Is this not connecting? Or He goes 90 feet up, right? And he walks a distance of 120 pi feet horizontally. Yeah, six pi times the radius. Okay? So what? <laughs> so what? What is our T going to be between? Let's, let's try it this way. What is our T going to have to be between here? Zero and six pi. Do you all agree with that? That'll draw us three complete circles. We need to be able to plug in 0 for t and be how high? How high are we when t is 0? 0. And then when we plug in 6 pi, where do we need to be? 90. At 90 feet. How do we make that happen? How do, we, how do we make that happen? What needs to be here? That when I plug in 0, I get 0. But when I plug in 6 pi, I get 90. Something over, 90 over, close, 90 over. Oh, no, no, no. Hold on. This is the hardest part is to, to help you see what needs to go in here. Is it a linear function? It's a linear function, right? It's linear? OK, so it needs to be t. And when I plug in 0, that's going to give me 0. But when I plug in 6 pi, it needs to give me 90, right? So what do I need to scale this by in front? 90 over 6 pi. There we go. That makes sense? So look, I'm going to scrap this because I don't think this was going to help us get there. Okay, this was more just thinking through it. All right, at t equals zero, how high do we want to be off the ground? Zero. At t equals uh, six pi, we've done the three revolutions, but now we need to be 90 feet high. So when I plug in six pi into this, the six pi's cancel. I'm 90 feet high. Now, what is the uh, what is the slope 
of this line right here, of this right here. I think, Saba, that's what you were saying is that 